You're not really a real estate investor unless you're cash poor. That's mostly a beginning thing. Building reserves, like it's it sucks having money that's dead, that's not doing anything, but having that money for the rainy day when you need it and also to jump on opportunities when there's no lending because the first thing that goes away in an economic crisis is the ability to get credit. Welcome to the Good Stewards Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to seasoned real estate investors who want to maximize the cash flow potential in their business. We are buy and hold investors with a thousand plus properties and markets across the US who bring an insider's view into the nitty gritty details of real estate investing. If you're looking to develop the mindset, teams, and systems that can dramatically build your real estate business and net worth, you're in the right place. Welcome to this episode of the Good Stewards Podcast. I'm Ryan Dossey. I'm Amanda Perkins. I'm Bill Sirius. And I'm Andrew Sirius. Welcome to be with the Good Stewards this morning in an odd time in our history. Our nation is obviously going through some real tumultuous experiences financially and otherwise. But do check us out at thegoodstewards.com. Subscribe to our podcast. And we're going to have a lot of practicalities coming your way in terms of how you face down a looming recession. And as real estate investors or people who wanting to get into the real estate market, thinking about uh, how they should think about the balancing their financial uh, commitments and their uh, savings, et cetera, we'd like to get into all of that. So COVID-19 is uh, upon us and we want to respond. So I bet we all have a, a story to tell. Mine is uh, quite interesting. Kind of the world turned on this axis for me. I was uh, with my wife. Uh, we took a quick trip to Las Vegas, actually, and it was uh, March, uh, first weekend of March. Uh, what was just a couple weekends ago. And uh, at that point, uh, Vegas was humming. Uh, we were there at the Bellagio. We went to shows. We, we Ubered around. I asked people how it was going because, of course, this was on the horizon. But all of a sudden, you know, uh, they, well, they were saying, you know, our business is down. As a matter of fact, somebody told me it was down 14 percent at the Bellagio at this point. I asked the Uber drivers how things were going. They said, well, the weeks were the week was slow, but the weekend picked right up and it was just as good as you know, normal type of thing. Little did we know that within two weeks, the entire strip would be shut down, all the casinos uh, shut down, virtually all of them. Uh, the Pac-12 uh, championship with a women's tournament where the Oregon Ducks were uh, primary, you know, they were a powerhouse team. We got to see them the second to the last uh, game they played uh, against uh, Arizona. And little did we know that they would only play one more game and then the Pac-12 tournament would be shut down and then the men's tournament would be shut down. The NBA would be shut down on and on and on. So I don't know if others of us have some just to me, this has been obviously a a disconcerting going from that reality to the present reality that we have and the implications of that. Well, I was um, last Wednesday I was in Oregon uh, (laughs) and I was planning to head to Mexico, Cabo for vacation that I really needed, but my family wasn't coming with me. And Wednesday night was when the NBA shut down and um, there was something else that happened big that, oh, Oregon schools, maybe, nope, they hadn't closed yet. But anyway, that's, there was that's a when lot of, Mexico announced that uh, they were going to build a wall and the United States was going to pay, to pay for, for it. it. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, my husband was really nervous about it happening, but I decided to throw caution to the wind and hop on the flight and go down to Mexico on Thursday. And in four nights that I was gone, it felt like the sky fell and it was really unsettling to be away from my family. Um, obviously a lot of anxiety just in being home. It's, it was surreal to come home through and go through customs and do all of that thing, you know, like not wanting to be next to people. The guy sitting next to me on the airplane, of course, coughed for the whole way home on me. And I felt like one of those people who's a germaphobe who I happen to live with my husband. <laughs> and I felt what it felt like to be him in that moment because. So he's just locked you in a room for the past two weeks. <laughs> 
<laughs> he said he's willing to still be around me, but nobody else will. And um, it was just, honestly, it was easier to be, it's easier to be home and dealing with it than it was to be out of the country. And it is so weird. And I've just been so, like, my constant, what's coming out of my mouth is, let's not panic. Let's just hit the pause. Let's not try to make really rash decisions that are going to affect us into the future. The whole country kind of needs to be on pause. It needs a timeout. <laughs> we need to be kind to each other. There are a lot of us that are in industries that are going to survive a little bit better than those restaurant workers that are being shut down and that sort of thing. And so, you know, those are just the kinds of things that you think about, like, we didn't lose all of the money out of our bank account from one day to the next. And so we don't need to act like we did. And so it's just, it's something to be, that's what, that's my constant message. Just take a deep breath. We all just have to pick up the pieces when we get to the end of this. We've seen other areas that have been under quarantine and they are starting to pick back up and have business as usual. This is not our new normal. This is a very temporary situation, I believe. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was reading, I think even in, you know, Wuhan of people talking of kind of, you know, life going back to business as usual, buddies going out fishing and talking, you know, it was kind of, it was kind of a weird few months. I, I think for, for me and for my companies, we've always kind of had the the slogan of things normally aren't as, uh, as good or as bad as they initially seem. Right. I remember, uh, bigger pockets at one point was testing a notification feature where they were going to ping every single bigger pockets member, um, with a notification and they wanted to test it with my answering service call Porter. Hey, we're going to, we're going to hit whatever it is, you know, 500,000 million people, with a notification that call Porter members get a discount on your services. And we were like, this is going to, this is going to change our business. And that notification dropped and we got one client. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> oh, oh, that was disappointing. <laughs> you know, at the same time, we've had these um, other times where it's like, oh my gosh, it feels like the sky is falling, but it's like, you take a step back, you take a deep breath and, you know, it's, it's truly in my experience, stuff really isn't as, as bad as it normally seems. I'm not, you know, downplaying the severity of what's going on, but I'm saying from the, I think, emotional stress, fear standpoint that, you know, social media kind of has our country swimming in, um, it's probably a good idea to take a break. It's probably a good idea to not have the news on 24 uh, seven. My wife will even be like, Hey, you've, you've already checked that today. Like, let's do something different. I'm like, okay, that's fair. <laughs> I deleted all social media off my phone and like unsubscribed to all my news things. So if I need to look at it, I can go search for it, but I can't, I want to not be, I don't want to be responsible for making really rash decisions that are going to affect people negatively because I was feeling anxious about the conditions that were happening today because this is not our new normal. This is a temporary situation and we've never seen anything like this before. So it's so unsettling, but I, you know, we have projects well, going I mean, on. The black I went, death, the <laughs> but we, we weren't it's a part of that. But, Spanish flu. <laughs> Ebola um, in Africa. You know, we have people. projects that are going on and I don't want to just screech them all to a halt and then realize the consequences of putting, you know, the construction workers out, the trades out, you know, when we have planned to, you know, we have the resources planned to do these projects. And I, I don't think this is forever. This is just for a little bit so that we don't overwhelm our medical we'll services. Break the system. I mean, it's been interesting to watch 300 million plus people become preppers overnight. And yeah, you know how, the preppers feel real good right now, yeah, though. <laughs> well, also, it's like if you're going to – like preppers don't – you don't need to prep for everything. You get guns and ammo and then – you can just take what the other prepper. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> the, the, the wrong podcast, wrong podcast. That's next week. Um, but no, it's also, uh, I don't, the toilet paper thing, like, God, I wish there's, I, I should have invested in big toilet paper before <laughs> well, this. That's a, uh, that's, I, think I don't understand that one. I mean, I understand the liquid gold thing, you know, the hand sanitizer, but, um, toilet paper, I mean, that is not an essential. There's other options. We won't go into that in detail. Uh, but there are the other shower. options. <laughs> uh, it is, 
it is sort I mean, I would say, I'd say one of the things to look at with the, like, just watched the film Contagion yesterday, which was why uh, did you watch? What that? Is wrong Let's with have you? everybody I, do I was, that. I was interested. It, 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 well, I was first of all, this movie was absolutely horrible. Andrew's like um, not feeling so anxious boring. enough. Let it, me try it was, this. Well, it, no, it's actually bored me to death. It was. It had like they went with like let's have, tell instead of telling like one good story, we'll tell twenty bad nice. ones. It was it was based off the H one N one the uh, swine flu and it's interesting how I barely even knew that one was that was obviously smaller than that well it ended up affecting sixty million Americans but that ended up being substantially smaller or I don't even remember people talking I mean a little bit like I heard about oh I think was not our younger brother my younger brother you know Mark get it I think he did I don't even know like I'm that's not how sure. I much don't think it so, did but- it affect it but. I mean, everything about it was was all over the place. Like the the panic started after like a million people had already died. <laughs> like that's mm-hmm. when when the stores started getting ra- raided and things like that. I think one of the things just watching it, how they assumed a massive pandemic would go, and that one was much that make believe pandemic was far worse than even what we're dealing with now. Um, is it's hard to predict the future. You don't know exactly what's going to happen, and uh, you know we could uh, you know uh, we've. I've had discussions with people saying like the economic fallout will be substantially worse than, than the virus itself. Um, you know, people die from recessions, generally speaking. So there, I'd say one of these, it is a temporary thing. It's not going to be a forever, but it's hard. People can't deal with uncertainty. I would suspect people, if we just said there were going to be 1 million deaths, probably a very, very hot, bad case scenario that would actually be comforting people if they actually knew what was going to happen. And so I think some of the things is just getting comfortable with knowing that you can't know what the actual, what's going to happen. Welcome to business. Yeah. There is going, there is <laughs> uncertainty. This is business in general, especially now there is always going to be uncertainty and it's something that you have to become a little bit more comfortable with. And also I think with regards to uncertainty, the best way to deal with it is basically making your company anti-fragile as best you can. And it is anti-fragile is a concept that comes from Nassim Taleb. He was the guy who popularized the, the concept of black swans, which is ironic because we're basically dealing with a black swan right now. Um, why, why don't you tell everybody what a black swan is, Andrew? Sure. A black a swan is an extremely unlikely event or unpredictable event that radically changes things. So but like everyone thought there used to be a saying in Europe, like, something about a black swan because they're only white swans. Like you're, li- you're as likely to see that as a black swan because they're, they don't exist. And then I don't know where it was, Australia or somewhere they found black swans. And so it's like, okay, this is something that your previous history hadn't, um, hadn't, uh, shown any possibility of, you had no evidence that this could even happen. Um, things like, uh, nine 11 or for example, would be one of those. This could be, well, I mean, we certainly have had pandemics before. There was swine flu, SARS, bird flu, whatever. But we weren't prepared. For, we weren't expecting something of this magnitude nor this effect on the economy. Um, another example would be like uh, a lot of economic models were based on this. Um, economic model, there was a massive crisis that led to the um, Asian financial crisis that was started by this company called Long Term financial management, I think it's called, long-term, long-term capital management. And they created this incredibly complex formula to measure the economy, like the markets and stuff like that. And But they based it off five years of data. Now, if they'd gone back further, they would have included other sorts of data. But because they based it on five years, of, they actually won the Nobel Prize for it in economics, which says something about the Nobel Prize in economics, because as soon as this crisis hit, they collapsed. They had to be bailed out. It basically spiraled out of control and caused... Uh, a lot of, especially East Asian, Southeast Asian countries to just go into complete tailspins. And this is in the late 90s. Same thing happened more or less with this over-reliance on modeling in uh, uh, for the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, that wasn't the only reason. There was the the uh, ninja loans and, and teaser rates and the Fed keeping the rate too low and all sorts of other reasons. But um, this is one of the reasons to be careful with like these models saying, you know, you know, 50 million people or whatever going to die. They, they, they don't know. Nobody knows. We just know that we need to be careful at this time. But making yourself anti-fragile means that you can, that you can basically take advantage of black swan events because he, he, he outlines three different types. There's fragile companies will break. Those are the companies that like, you know, AGI or AIG or, or most banks 
wildly over leveraged during the financial crisis in 2008 and they just collapsed and then begged uh begged mom you know daddy mommy government to come bail them out um like uh and then uh or you could be robust which you survive these things or you can be anti-fragile where you actually thrive in them and one of the key things is to be is one to i mean one of the big things for being anti-fragile in in uncertain environments is to keep relatively high cash reserves, savings accounts. If this is individual, don't live beyond your means. I mean, okay, this is more for the next one. I mean, if you're already in this situation, you're already in this situation. But keeping high cash reserves, like living below your means. If, if, if you have, like living your dream now requires paying every penny you have and more, hoping that you'll get that raise or something like Scale that, it's not dream. worth it. Scale back, get to your <laughs> dreams later. For your company, I mean, obviously, small businesses, you're getting started, you're going to be cash poor. Real, I, We've said before, real estate investment, you're not really a real estate investor unless you're cash poor. That's mostly a beginning thing. Building reserves, like it's it sucks having money that's dead, that's not doing anything, but having that money for the rainy day when you need it, and also to jump on opportunities when there's no lending. Because the first thing that goes away in an economic crisis is the ability to get credit. And so if you have the ability to jump on those with cash, uh, that is a huge, huge benefit. Building a, a stable of private lenders, some of them will actually be ready to jump in with you. Uh, you're going to lose some in in economic uncertainty because they don't want to. They want to put their money in a savings account or under their mattress. But having a large number of them ready to go, and then like, okay, you don't want it, you don't want it, but you do. We can jump on this big project, maybe partner on it. Uh, so. Lots of you know contacts with potential lending sources. This is one of the reasons we don't settle for dealing with one bank. We want, we have I think eleven different banking relationships who've given us loans in Kansas City because we know in an economic crisis we're probably going to lose eight or nine of them. But maybe there's two that will stay I with us and continue to offer credit. An example that happened yesterday: we have a, an apartment complex in Eugene, and it performs at over one hundred percent of. Vac- like we don't have a vacancy factor there just because other fees. So it's this really solid performing apartment complex. And I've been working with a bank on refinancing it and I really already had a green light. And then um, I think the lending officer I was working with got overwhelmed and he sort of went dark for six weeks. So it picks back up last week and, you know, they have all of our information. We have a great relationship with them. And I get a call at the end of the day yesterday and he says, talk to the underwriter and this is just not going to fit our model right now. And I said, a fully performing apartment complex that we've owned for 15 years, that doesn't fit your model. And he goes, yeah, underwriter. And I, I mean, I didn't ask the question, but the answer is they're not making any loans right now because everyone's scared. And so these are the kinds of things that are like crippling. This is the kind of thing that cripples down the future because it's like, you're going to pull everything back, which is what the banks did the last time. And then nobody can get a loan. And then here we go all, all over again. But this is a building where historically, since we've owned it for 15 years, people pay their rent. We know what the costs are on it. It is a no brainer of a, you know, it's not something we're trying to reposition. It's not something that we're trying to put a bunch of rehab into. We've already paid for all of it. We're just trying to refinance because the loan on it is old. And here we are. And, and I, there's another situation you could talk to, <clears throat> Amanda, and that's in Dallas. We're refinancing, is it 40 some houses? 47, I think. 47 houses. And uh, we're doing it with a company because we're getting a lower interest rate. And also they will go to 30 years. And we've had a, we have a 20 year amortization on it. Fortunately, didn't have a prepayment penalty. We only got it less than a year ago, but we, we want to stretch out our payments and, and uh, become more anti-fragile there. That's, that was our intention. We've been working on this for a couple of months now, and it will be very interesting to see if they will pull the trigger. We've already paid 40 some thousand dollars, done all the appraisals on this. I think it's, you can tell me the numbers exactly. Yeah, Amanda, that's but. about right. And I mean, I'll, I mean, it's, it's still a performing portfolio, which, you know, like for us, you know, we're a cash flow industry and we have renters and we rely obviously on those rents to make our monthly obligations. We keep reserves. You know, this didn't really hit until after most of the rents had been collected in March. So, you know, like March, we're okay. What does April look like? Why? Well, I don't think it's going to be, I think a lot of people are going to still pay their rent because I think they're going to prioritize having a place to live over a lot of other things. So I'm not going to assume that we're not collecting any rents last month or next month. 
I'm going to assume there are going to be people with problems. And, you know, I've talked, Andrew kind of had told me, you know, like, all right, we'll just do what we'll th- think about what it, what the banks did during the bailout last time. We'll rewrite some leases. We'll tack on what they owe us to the next thing. We'll, you know, this is temporary. Okay. So April, they have problems. May, they might have problems too. Then they get back to work, you know, ideally at some point in May, let's say. It's and May. This, is, this is a really good practical question. If you're a buy and hold investor, like we are, we have lots and lots of residents. We don't call them tenants. We call them residents or renters. And, uh, the question is, let's say they do lose their job or whatever. Should we file an eviction? Now, I think the question really revolves around their how they have treated us in terms of the past. Because if they've been, uh, you know, looking for an excuse to bail out on rent, or they've beat up their if we place or something every month. Yeah, th- <laughs> then there I'm going to file an eviction like I would anybody else. If, if you they've can been a, file an eviction, because are, I will yeah. say eviction Portland coming. put right. a okay. freeze on evictions yesterday. Yeah, so the stress of the state's coming in Oregon and I assume everywhere else. Yeah, many, many places. That's true. So you do what you, you can do. Indiana will be the last. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> you, also, you also need to remember you have you need to have you know, the same guidelines for each, each resident. So you can't, you can't treat people radically differently. Well, you can, um, you can choose to, you can choose to evict who you want to evict if they haven't paid rent. That's your choice. That was not one of those, uh, you know, uh, discriminatory situations. But what I'm saying here is that your resident base is precious to you. Having good residents is what it's all about and buy and hold investment. They're like gold. So if you have good residents who are affected by this situation, I would try to hang on to that resident. And as Amanda said, tack on, do, you know, figure out a way to uh, pay over time. You can't obviously hold on to uh, situations where you have numerous people who are not paying rent. I'm not really saying that because you've got to do what you can do to protect your bottom line. But there might be choices that you make to hold on to good residents in bad economic times that 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 can't pay you temporarily, or maybe the law mandates that they don't have to pay you well, temporarily. I would, you know, just like what the banks did, you just, you know, we get told a lot of stories that aren't the truth. So the best we can do is verify what they're telling us, you know, ask them to provide us with their financial Letter information. We're mm-hmm. at, we are, Bank statements. We're, we're owed that they can give that to us. And you know, there's going to be lots of people that reach out early, reach out early. I mean, even people that it's not going to be us, but people that, you know, you're going to have a problem making your mortgage payment next month or whatever. Like you should probably start reaching out to your bank now or start, you know, trying to figure out another like, are you going to have to take a loan on your IRA or 401k or that sort of thing? One strategy also might be to ask your bank if they would uh, not require you to pay principal, but you pay the interest. So you're still paying on the loan, but you're uh, not having to pay principal. That is probably not for this month. Maybe it's for the next month or the month after that, if you're in uh, dire straits kind of thing. And the one good thing about this situation, if there is a good thing, is that we're all in this together. Everybody knows everybody's business here. Banks realize what's what's going on. And they're not going to... Banks gonna, don't want all the foreclosures. They don't want to <laughs> pop the foreclosure button, that kind of thing. They, You know, this is a... Uh, an economic pandemic as much as a uh, one thing I'd highly pandemic. recommend that Bill's kind of touching on is more communication, not less. Um, you know, one of the one of the guys in my group reached out to me and was like, hey, you know, I, I have a flip that was supposed to sell and the buyer just got laid off. And so the bank's not going to do the loan anymore. And his like deal with his private lender is he gets charged a point a month on top of interest after like six months. And I was like, well, first thing I would do is call him and explain, hey, look, you know what the situation is. I know what the situation is. We had a good deal here set to close and it fell through. Here's what I'm doing to try to fix it. But you may need to end up working with me here, right? Um you know, more communication, not less, I think is, is key. Private lenders, banks, um, you know, get, get real, um, squirrely when you start to go quiet. I mean, that's when, 
if you want to be treated like a human being, treat the people you're working with like a human being. If you want to be treated like a number, uh, well, just shut down <laughs> and let them let them deal with you. So I think that I think that goes for um, you know residents as well. I think one of the interesting things is for some of our residents, like financially, they're actually doing better right now. You know, if you were a DoorDash driver or an Amazon worker, they are slammed. Working in a grocery store, working in medical services. Have a services. toilet paper manufacturing <laughs> plant. Uh, yeah. I mean, so I, I think that's, I think the one thing that's unique about this is that there are, there are small businesses right now. I mean, you could have had the most awful tasting, worst meal delivery service that existed. And you have more orders than you can fulfill right now for your, you know, microwaved chicken or whatever it was, Right. So I think that's one of the one of the things to keep in mind is like, yeah, this is definitely going to affect residents. I mean, people who worked in retail, people who did things like, you know, car sales or travel. And, and I think, you know, different markets are going to feel it differently. Um, you know, like on the military end, if you're in an area that has military housing, um, civilian contractors aren't going to work right now. Right. So if you are running to civilian contractors, that's a problem. If you weren't, well, you're good. <laughs> so I, I really think it's just a matter of kind of rolling with the punches and doing, it's kind of like Bill's talked about with buying deals. We're looking at the best, most accurate data we have and making the best offers that make sense based off of the facts we currently have. Uh, that doesn't mean we're not going to be extra cautious. Maybe instead of offering 75% of ARV, we go down to 70% or 65% like it used to be even. But I was talking to somebody who was like really freaking out, like the sky's falling. And I was like, look, people are always going to trade cash for something of value. So if I have a $100 bill, would you buy it from me for $90? What about 80? About 70? What about 45 bucks? At a certain point, it's like, yeah, I'll take it. I know with us in particular, we're going down market of cheaper, lower end properties because a $20,000 duplex in a C minus neighborhood that pulls in a thousand bucks a month, is always going to be appealing to someone, right? Um, so I think it's really just pivoting. And then for us, it's kind of like uh, day by day, week by week, of, okay, are people still wanting cash offers? Are buyers still buying? And I mean, from what we've found so far, the answer is yes. Well, and one of the things is it's like, okay, well, what's the worst case scenario? I'm not really allowing myself to go to that place. Um, we always are planned several months in advance, really honestly, a month to, or I'm sorry, a year to 18 months out in the future financially. And that's just how we have to run our business. But I can't, once I start going to the doomsday, this is happening. It's not happening right now. And I almost fear that if everybody does start to go that doomsday, it makes it happen because everyone panicked. And this is a temporary situation. We know that from watching other places that have these quarantines relaxing and opening back up. At some point, we have, we pick back up where we left off. And so I just, I can't, I can't go to that dark place mentally. It will, it will cripple me. It will cripple my ability to move on. So I have to just, I can take what my problem is in front of me. I know that we did a good job of planning ourselves out. Like I said, for about 12 to 18 months, and I'm going to follow that plan until I need to really pivot myself into a different direction. But I, I will say, I mean, just on, you know, stewardship as a whole, um, to, to their credit, I remember probably two years ago, a uh, year and a half ago, when we started looking at cash position and realized, okay, we want more reserves on hand. So we started selling some stuff we maybe didn't want to sell. Um, you know, we started flipping stuff that maybe we'd initially planned on keeping. And, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, that you may be in that position right now of, okay, you're less liquid than you want to be. So maybe you've got to cut bait on a few properties. Maybe you need to wholesale a few. Um, you know, it may be a little bit higher, harder for you to find a buyer, but at the end of the day, if you still have something that has a great return on investment on it, there's somebody who probably wants it. So, uh, I, I don't know. I think that's just really stewardship's 
board of directors was a great thing that was done. And I think a lot of people, they need to start making that change now. Well, thank you. Thank you to Andrew for uh, initiating <laughs> yeah. all that. I really do believe, you know, thank like to lab. <laughs> Summers. He is, he is actually an incredible jerk, but he's he's extremely smart. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have him on he's as our he, next guest, by the uh, way. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he's gonna come on, but no, he, he's the best kind of jerk. Uh, yeah, but he's yeah, but also uh, the worst kind, a jerk that's right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, mean, I definitely re- recommend his books. Anti Fragile, um, Skin in the Game, and, and Black Swan are definitely worth reading, and especially since you're gonna be shut in for a while. You might as well. Uh, Get some books. You're probably going to need to do Audible or Kindle since Amazon's not going to be delivering anything but hand sanitizer <laughs> and face masks for the next month. Yeah, hopefully toilet but paper. I'm looking for that delivery any day gone. now. <laughs> toilet paper, I mean, sells from, like, toilet paper sells more from, than cash. You might as well just use $100 bills. I want to tell I mean, you, at the, little local, been, Andrew. <laughs> at the little local store yesterday, they had a ton of toilet paper. You could get four rolls for $4.79. <laughs> I I then sent Amanda a photo that I got off of Facebook, of course, that showed somebody with an unrolled toilet paper on their their spool still, and it had a day of the week or per for square. each uh, sheet <laughs> for each square. So that's a way to save, I'd say. I think my favorite one I've seen so far was a, a bottle of bottle of like a, a box of hand sanitizers. And I said, you know, looking to trade for a uh, 3,500 turbo diesel dually. Don't lowball me. I know what I have. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's, uh, it's funny. Well, or a we're... chubby, chubby baby that says me after I ate all my quarantine food in one setting. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot to talk about, obviously. Really uh, important things. And we uh, we encourage you to come back uh, frequently. Tell your friends about our podcast. We're going to go live on uh, every week, starting uh, this week uh, or next. And please follow us, uh, subscribe to us. Again, tell your friends about us. We've got a lot to talk about in the future. How real estate investing is affected by this pandemic situation in our country in all aspects. You think of Airbnbs, you think of uh, people are holding lots, uh, building new construction. A lot of questions out there. We'll try to give you some sane answers. Uh, So please stay with us and follow us. Thanks. Yeah, we're basically just going to live stream you through it. So, (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely.